welcome to Welcome Road Baptist Church and the Fundamentals of Christianity. My name is Dan Odom. Thank you for stopping by today. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing, giving us a thumbs up, and also if you would leave a comment down below in the comments section. We did a video on, uh, this is the second video that we're doing on faith and works, faith and works, and what is necessary and needed for salvation. Some believe that faith is all that is needed. Some believe that uh, faith plus works, being a good person, and not just being a good person, but following the commands of God. Uh, and along with that would be maintaining our faith and continuing to believe our faith in, in, in God and those things. So we looked at Romans chapter number four in another video on, uh, entitled Faith and Works. And we saw that in Romans four, Paul is very clear and very plain that to be justified before God, we, uh, it's by faith. It is simply by faith and not by the deeds of the law. But uh, what we're going to look at today is found in James chapter number two. And in James chapter number two, the way James writes, it seems to be a bit of a contradiction. Uh, James, in these verses that we're going to look at, says that a man is justified by faith. He asks the question, can faith, uh, can faith alone save a man? And so we want to look at James chapter number two, uh, beginning with verse 14. And go into, again, not a lot of detail, but try to give the overall um, context of the verses to clear up maybe any misconceptions or seeming contradictions between Paul and James. Because when we read Romans 4 and we read James chapter number 2, it seems like there is a contradiction. And so we want to try to interpret Scripture and I will tell you, we'll mention this as we read through our verses, that it is highly important when interpreting Scripture to keep everything in context. And now you're going to hear everyone say that, okay? Um, there are those that, again, believe you have to have works with salvation, uh, following the commands of God. And they'll take the passage and they'll say this is the interpretation and the context of the passage. And so... Uh, you'll have differences of opinion and differences of interpretation, okay? And so I'd like to give you uh, uh, my thoughts on James chapter 2 and th this whole passage and what it, what it really is dealing with. And I think we may be surprised when we look at context and what James is talking about. James chapter 2, we have verses 14 through 17 up here, and we're going to read all of the verses down through verse 26. So be patient as we read this. Please follow along in your Bible and uh, follow along with the verses on, on the screen. James 2.14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? That's That verse, that right there, can faith save him without works? And there's that is the beginning of the con seeming contradiction with Paul. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. There it is. There's another aspect of this that raises many questions. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my work. Now James is beginning to give some clarity, I believe, to what he is focusing on. Verse number 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now I'll pause the reading for just a moment. What James is about to do, he is about to give us two examples from the Old Testament of two Old Testament saints that had works with their faith. The first is Abraham. Verse 21, 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. So he says, you see now, don't you understand and don't you see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Verse 25, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, the very beginning, I asked the question, faith or works? So why is this? Why does Paul and James seem to be contradicting one another? One says, by faith we are saved. And another says, without works, our faith is dead. Now, I'm going to give three points, three thoughts for that I really encourage you to truly consider very carefully. Uh, what we are looking at. Um, Someone very famous once said this, that we are, and I don't agree with this, and hear me out, we are are saved by faith alone, but but the faith that saves is never alone. Okay, now what does that statement imply? That statement tells us that we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. That implies that when we are saved, we will always be working, that there will be works and the producing of works uh, and these things in our lives. Now you say, Brother Dan, don't you agree with that? Do you be- are you saying that a man can be saved and there's not going to be any evidences of that salvation? No, there's going to be evidences of salvation. And those evidences will be the fruit of the Spirit, those things that God produces in and through our lives. Will our lives be changed and will our lives be different? Well, most certainly they will be. But when will they be different and when will they be changed? When we yield to the working of God in our life. Is it possible for a child of God not to yield to God? Most certainly it is. Most certainly a person can be born again and they can be saved and on their way to heaven but there's not any fruit. There's not any evidences of that. Why? Because they're not walking in the Spirit. Paul is very plain on that in Galatians 5. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 and verse 16. If you walk in the Spirit, if you yield to the Spirit, then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if I'm not yielded to the Spirit, if I'm not walking in the Spirit, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do the works of the flesh. Now, what is James dealing with here in James chapter number 2? Is James saying in James chapter 2 in this passage that, um, that you will work? No, James is not saying that, and we're going to see in just a few minutes. James is dealing with three aspects of faith and three things concerning faith. Now, I know um, as we dive and go into this, this passage um, is a passage that that is really used to cause people, um, I'm going to say it, to live under a cloud of guilt and and, and a cloud of doubt. And let me explain this. Have you ever heard, now listen, and don't misunderstand me, and I'm not being critical. I'm really not, okay? Because I've said this, okay? Um, If you're... If you're born again, you're going to live for God. If you're born again, you're going to do this. If you're saved, you're going to do that. If you're really a child of God, you're going to you're going to be doing this, that, and the other thing. Okay, have you ever heard that? Okay, and what happens the moment you hear that? We begin to do a, we begin to examine within ourselves to make sure that we're living up to that standard. We're we're we're, we're going to make sure that we're doing that. And then when we don't, it brings about guilt. It brings about uh, not just of the feeling of failure, okay, and not conviction, 
but it brings us under a cloud of doubt and a cloud of guilt. Then we'll say this, well, if I was really saved, I wouldn't keep looking at pornography. If I was really saved, I wouldn't keep cursing. If I were really saved, I would love my wife unconditionally. If I was really saved, my uh, my husband, I would, I would uh, love my husband. If I was really saved, I would do this and I would do that and all of these other things. Okay, now, if we are saved, our lives are going to be different. Why? Because we have the Spirit of God within inside of us. But that difference is going to come in time as the Holy Spirit works Himself inside of us first. A prime example of people in the Bible that had all of the right works, but they weren't saved. Matthew chapter number 7. Lord, Lord, did we not do many marvelous works in thy name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And Christ says, I'm going to turn to them and I'm going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Ah, but they had the works. Okay, now why am I, why am I kind of focusing on, on this? Because I, I want you to understand and I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, well, the preacher says that, uh, that we don't have to, to do this, we don't have to do that, and we can just float through life. And No, 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 no. I believe that our lives will be different, and I believe that our lives will be changed. But what I want to show you from this passage, and this is what, and that is exactly what James is dealing with, that our lives should be different. But this passage, many people have taken this passage and said, you must work for your salvation. See, faith without, without works is dead. If you don't have works plus your faith, then you have a vain faith. But then there are those that say this, if you're really saved, you will keep living for God until the day that you die. You will persevere and you'll be faithful. Okay, and that is not what James is talking about here at all. So what is James talking about? First, consider this, James is talking about the profitable faith or a faith that is profitable. What, what in the world? Look at the, Let's look at the text. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? Now, don't let the word save throw you off. Let me give you an example. You can use the same word uh, in two different contexts and have two different meanings. And let's use the word save. I'm going to save my money. I'm going to save my puppy from dying. I use the same word save, but within the context, it has a completely different meaning. It has a completely different understanding. So don't let the word save, which does mean deliver, don't let that, that one little word uh, uh, control the context. Let the context of what James is talking about control the meaning of the words. He says, what does it profit, my brethren, if a man have faith but he doesn't have works? Can faith save him? Can that, can that faith deliver him? Now, we do understand that save in the Bible means to deliver. And there are three aspects of salvation. There's justification, there's sanctification, and there's glorification. The overall idea of salvation in the Word of God is changing. God transforming me. God changing me. God giving me a new nature. God doing this wonderful work in my life. Now, if I have faith, but I don't have any works with that faith, can that faith change me and do what God intends for that faith to do? He's asking a question, but then he gives us an example. Look at verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, they have a need. And one of you say unto them, so these people with the need go to an individual that can meet the need. And this is what the individual says, depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. Oh, wait a minute. What doth it profit? Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, let's look at this. What doth it profit? Now, what did he just say in verse 14? What does it profit? And then he gives us an example of two individuals or an individual that has a need. They go to a person that can meet that need, but the individual that can meet that need doesn't meet the need. And James turns around and says, what profit, what, where's the profit? What good is it? 
that you can meet the need, but you didn't. Does that ability to meet the need help the person that you did not help? Well, no, of course not. Now, what is James dealing with right here? James is dealing with a faith that is unprofitable. It's not profitable. Oh, the person in the, in the congregation that has the food and that has the warm clothing, oh, they're profiting. I'm profiting through my faith. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm saved in the eyes of God. I mean, God's delivered me. I've got what I need for my body. But now someone comes to me and they have a need. Is my faith profitable? No, it's not. It's not doing them any good. It's not doing the cause of Christ any good, which we're going to see that in just a few minutes. Then he says in verse 17, even so faith, just like this example, just like this example that I've given to you, it doesn't profit these people anything simply to say, be warmed and feel. You've not taken any steps. You've not helped meet that need. You're not doing anything uh, to show your love and concern. Many things that we could put into that, even so faith. If it doesn't have any works, it's dead being alone. Now, don't let the word dead being alone, don't let that throw you off. What is death? Death is the separation of life. But that's the key. Death is separation. When an individual dies and they are buried, okay, their body is very much in the ground. But are they dead? No, their spirit and soul is living somewhere, either heaven or in hell, but they're very much alive. So what is death? Death is separation. Here, James is just simply letting, letting us know that our faith is dead, that our faith is simply separated, not separated as it is from God, but separated from those things that are profitable. It's dead. Now, why am I saying, why, why, why are we focusing on this? And why James is establishing that our faith needs to be profitable and it's going to be profitable to other people. And this is why he's using this example of these individuals that are destitute of daily food. They have a need. They come to me. They ask me to help them. I can help them, but I say, no. Well, what is the profit? What does it profit? What does simply, and I simply saying the words, be warmed and feel, what good does it do? Well, it doesn't do any good. It's not profitable. First thought, the the profitability of faith, faith that is profitable. But secondly, consider this, the producing of faith or faith that is produced. Now, James is continuing this thought. He says, is your faith profitable? Is your faith profitable? Is it changing you? Is it helping others? Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith. So a man may say this, you have faith. And I have works. And this is what the man says. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. A man or a woman that simply says, and this goes back to the profitability of faith. The fact that faith is profitable. The man that says, I am a Christian or I am saved and I am going to heaven. But there are no works behind that. That faith isn't profitable. They are not revealing that they are saved. Now, they may very well be saved. And I believe that there's a lot of individuals that are born again and they are saved. But their their faith is unprofitable. There's nothing in their life that comes to verse 18 that shows that faith is being produced. He says, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now again, we must be very careful. It's not just about works and because remember those people in Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you. Although you did all of these wonderful things, you didn't come to me by faith. You didn't receive me. But this is, James is focusing on the, uh, the producing of faith, faith that is produced. He says in verse number 19, thou believes that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. Now, this is not just simply a, um, like a demonic faith, you know, a faith, the faith of demons, okay? Well, even demons believe in God. Well, sure, demons know that there is a God, okay? And because of that, they, 
they believe and they tremble. Now, this is not necessarily a cut on these individuals. James is simply making the stating the fact, yes, you believe that there's God and you believe in God. That's good. Well, the devils also believe and they tremble. But what is James focusing on? That's great, but your faith is unprofitable. Your faith, it, it, it's unprofitable. And then he comes to verse number 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? There is, this goes back, again, to this producing of faith. My faith, if it's going to be alive, there must be works. Oh, um, the just shall live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But what is, what is faith? Faith is, is believing God. Faith is hearing the voice of God and responding. The just shall live by faith. My spiritual life comes as I live by faith, as I take those steps. Well, all James is letting us know is that the individual that is not following God, they, they don't have works in their life, they're not being obedient to God, their faith is, is dead. They're dying spiritually, they're separated from God. Now, not in the eternal sense and not in the sense of a sinner, but as a saint, as a child of God, they're out of that fellowship with God. So here, James is dealing with a faith that is profitable and a faith that produces. It will produce these works as we yield to God. Then the third thing I want you to consider, and this is where James is going. When faith is profitable, okay, and faith is producing it leads to this third thought, and that is the perfecting faith, or faith perfected. Now, James is taking these things, and so that there's no confusion, so that there's no misunderstanding in James' mind, so that we're not thinking, oh, well, I must do this in order to be saved, or if I, if I don't do this, then that means that I'm not saved. No, 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 no. James, James is going to give us an example of why it is so important that our faith is profitable and why our faith is producing, it is because it will perfect. Now look at look at these examples, okay, about Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now we know this story, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read these scriptures and then I'm gonna kind of go back, I'm gonna give you another slide and and break these these thoughts down. But was not Abraham our father justified by works when he'd offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? Now that word wrought, okay, that's an idea of to work with. And so his faith worked, this is going to sound odd, but his faith worked with his works. And by works, by those works, by faith and work working together, what happened? And by works was faith made perfect. Now notice that. His faith was made perfect, not alive, but perfect. The word perfect means to be mature and to be complete, not in the complete in the sense of, uh, in the sense of salvation, but to be perfected, to be matured, to grow. And so what James is letting us know is that when faith and works, when, when, I, when my faith is at work, what is it going to do? It's going to perfect me, mature me. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God and it was count, imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God. Now, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness happened in Genesis 15 and verse 6. Abraham offered his son Isaac on the altar in Genesis 22. That's what, six or seven chapters before. But notice what James says, that what was fulfilled was Abraham's righteousness. Okay, God declared Abraham righteous, just what we would term saved. Okay. In Genesis 15. But we see the fulfillment of that salvation or the completion of it, not again, not the completion like we have to work in order to complete our salvation, but the perfecting or the maturing of that salvation, the growth of that faith in Genesis 22. And then he says in verse 24, 
Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Justified where? In the eyes of God? No, but justified in the eyes of man. Now, I'm going to give you four or five little thoughts bringing all of this together. So what is James dealing with? James is dealing with a bunch of Christians whose faith had become unprofitable. They were persecuted. They were fleeing and running for their lives at some places, these Jewish believers. And James says, you're running, but you're not working. And your faith is unprofitable. Your faith must be producing. So your faith needs to be profitable and it needs to be producing. Why? So that then your faith can be perfected or so that your faith can grow, mature. Here's five little thoughts. Okay, I didn't break these down into individuals. I just put all five up there. Now, Abraham was justified by works when he offered Isaac in Genesis 22. But Abraham's faith was made perfect, complete or mature when he offered Isaac his son in verse number, in verse 22. The scripture was fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, here's a question. Was Abraham justified or made righteous before he offered Isaac in verse 23? The answer is yes. Now, many people will take this passage in James and they will say this. If you don't add works to your salvation, if, you're, if you don't strive to keep the law of God, then you cannot be saved. And they come here to James 2. But this is not what James 2 is dealing with. James is dealing with our faith being profitable producing and becoming perfect or perfecting. Now, what does James say? James says that Abraham was justified when he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, in Genesis 15, he was justified in the eyes of God. Genesis 22, when he offers his son, son on, the, uh, on the altar, uh, James says he is justified. Now, this is the question. What if Abraham did not offer his son Isaac on the altar? Was he still justified? Now, God already declared him righteous in Genesis 15. And God says, you believe me, you are righteous. You are justified. What if Abraham did not offer his son on the altar? Would he still have been considered justified in the eyes of God? The answer is a resounding yes. Paul says in Romans 4 that he was justified by faith. Genesis 15 says that he was justified because he believed God. So what is James dealing with? Number five, the offering of Isaac was a sign to others that he was a righteous man. And not even, going back to what James said, not even simply a sign to others, but to show that his faith was profitable to himself and to others. That what God has done for me God will do for you. So here in this, in James chapter number two, James again is not focused on, and James is not telling us that we must work and add works to our salvation. No, he's saying it's just not profitable. Your faith is not profitable to anyone else. It's not bringing about a change that God desires to bring about. It's not producing uh, anything in your life because it is dead, but let it perfect. Let faith and works come together so that your faith can mature, so that your faith can grow. Thank you for joining me uh, today and understand and remember that your salvation, my salvation, is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You place your faith in Christ, God has said, I will save you if you call upon me. That's what God said. So you call upon Jesus Christ for salvation. Faith and works need to be there, but it needs to be there so that your faith can perfect and can grow. May the Lord richly bless you today as you walk with the Lord Jesus Christ.